Hello and welcome to Small Golds, in case you missed the top gold, silver, and crypto stories for the week ended October 21st, 2018. Gold back in the spotlight, gold regaining its luster. Lots of stories on gold the past week or so. Kazakhstan adds nearly 5 tons of gold to reserves. Poland adds 9.5 tons. Russia adds 37 tons. Hungary adds 28 tons. Even India got into the act and added gold. And Fidelity to launch crypto trading platform. TD Ameritrade to launch crypto trading platform called Eris X. Backed adds Coinbase executive to team and Goldman Sachs invests in a crypto custody firm. And a, a Bitcoin ATM coming to a location near you soon. And the rise of stable coins. These are the gold and crypto stories we're going to be covering in today's in case you missed the top gold silver and crypto stories gold back in the spotlight all right there's your small gold mugs and they are featured on a couple of the videos because i didn't have an appropriate image to put on some of the week the nightly youtube live streams that we do or i do and this week we did a full seven of them what impact will the midterm elections have on the gold and silver markets we also did a YouTube on the new petrodollar backed by US oil, natural gas, and coal. We went over the Indian gold imports. They doubled in August. Then we then covered the Indian silver imports in August, which actually fell 35%. We discussed Hungary's game-changing gold purchase. And we covered Russia's latest addition to its gold reserves, 1.2 million ounces or 37 tons and then we covered it again in a live stream later in the evening and last night we discussed the big increases in JP Morgan and Brinks Comex vaults and also the commitment of traders and we discussed ETFs as well so check those out small gold live streaming every night at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on the YouTube channel let's take a look at the gold and silver prices during the week gold up a bit uh, about nine bucks, nine dollars and twenty cents. Silver up about two cents. Gold silver ratio end of the week at eighty four to one. Just a couple of quick tweets. If you give back your college diploma, will they cancel your outstanding student debt? I guess not. Highlighting the fact that a college degree you have no collateral. Uh oh, Hillary Clinton's van smashed into a pole in a parking garage unbelievable she had to get out of the car there um cliches are never different this time just an observation and this is a point i've been making for a while the bitcoin and cryptocurrency bubbles of 2013 and 17 were the first major financial bubbles in the past couple of centuries that were neither engineered by wall street nor participated in by wall street but i believe that the next crypto bubble will be different we're going to go through some stories on what Wall Street's doing to capitalize on what I believe will be a coming crypto boom. Now, I wasn't planning on covering this, but this is too moronic to let pass. And it's got nothing to do with gold or silver or cryptocurrencies. But Elizabeth Warren, I believe, scored a few own goals last week that deserve some commenting. Focahontas, Misu, Liawatha, Sachika Noea, I heard all of these um, references to Native Americans that um, people were making. And it started out, she released her DNA test. I don't know why she had to do this, what the pur purpose was. She wasn't being goaded recently. But I suppose she thought it makes sense to get this out of the way when she wants to run for president. So it's all out there. See... Me, Sue, no worries. I'm part Native American, so Donald Trump won't have that as an issue if I run against him in 2020. Well, wrong host star. The first, the first information, and she put together some little cheesy video showing her calling her DNA person who's explaining to her that she might have some relative in the distant past that is Native American. And the results basically show that she doesn't. Uh, great 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 grandmother might have been partially American Indian and that American Indian wasn't even Cherokee or or uh, I think the other one she said Delaware might have been Peruvian or 
it was so remote and had nothing to do with what she was claiming. And got down to the point where they say, yeah, maybe she's one 1,024th Native American. Now, they say that European Americans that have been in the United States uh, for you know, two or three hundred years all have some minor amount of Native American blood and that the amounts that Elizabeth Warren potentially has is less than half of that. So basically, she's not Native American at all. However, she claims to self-identify as a Native American. And she's been on TV talking about how her family, or her, her father's family, wasn't going to allow her mother to get married because she was a squaw and she was Cherokee and she was Delaware. And she's made a big issue of this her whole life. Um, but basically, the DNA test doesn't show much Native American blood at all. I mean, in her career, she's had this book called Pow Wow Chow, which I think is a relatively offensive title to have. And she lists this supposed recipe that was passed down from her, her grandmother, and it's signed Elizabeth Warren Cherokee. Well, also, to make it worse, apparently the Pow Wow Chow recipes were word-for-word -word copies of a famous fresh chef. So not only were they not Cherokee recipes, they were French recipes, and they weren't hers. Well, here's the cheesy video she did. She sat together and talked about how mean Donald Trump was and how a famous geneticist analyzed her DNA and concluded it contained Native American ancestry. And I said, quit while you're one 1,024th ahead. And she kept making a big deal out of it. And unfortunately for her, the Cherokee Nation thought it was a disgrace because being a Cherokee isn't about taking a DNA test. It's about belonging to a proud heritage. And Elizabeth Warren, from what I understand, has never tried to get admission into the Cherokee Nation and is basically trying to say she identifies as such and now she has the DNA test to prove it and the Cherokee Nation says no thank you. The DNA test is useless to determine tribal citizenship said the Cherokee Nation in response to Elizabeth Warren's release of the DNA test. So it looked like a cheap uh, stunt. I don't think she, she uh, did anyone any favors. I don't think she helped her cause. She didn't help the Democrats' cause, and she probably helped the Republicans' cause. So I'm not sure. But it didn't stop the media from trying to make it sound like she had done well. Chris Cizilla, CNN, Elizabeth Warren's DNA this video is meant to send a signal to Democrats. I'm running and I'm going to fight back. And I don't think that's how you fight back. I thought this is what fighting back looks like. There she is. Then CNN Politics. They, they didn't get it. After a few hours, this thing was out and everyone was mocking this whole DNA video. Elizabeth Warren releases a DNA test with strong evidence of Native American ancestry. It led me to post this. There's strong evidence of a crowd. I don't think so. All right. Well, then Heidi Heitkamp also. Sorry that there's just these, these are quite humorous. I have to cover them. She put out an ad. I don't know what she was trying to do. She, I guess she was trying to cash in on the fact that she voted against Kavanaugh and that she supports survivors and so on. And uh, she listed these people's names and they, she did not have the permission to do so. Some people were furious that they were outed as such and others claimed they weren't even abused. So I'm not sure what they're thinking when they, when they put together this kind of stuff. And then there was another issue. Donald Trump gave a speech at a rally where he clearly said that Grant was incredible and that Lee was a great general. Now, historically, both, if, if when I studied American history, there's books on Grant and Lee. They're considered two generals that were titans in military strategy. And Trump was absolutely right that the reason that the war went on so long was that Lincoln was not satisfied, for good reason, with his generals. 
Uh, McClellan especially was not a a leader of men that was able to vanquish the southern army and Lee was a very good strategist that's got nothing to do with defending slavery or defending the south I mean Romnell was a great general for the Nazis um, the, the British will admit that that's if a Hannibal was a a great general for the for the um, Carthaginians there are generals, um, Genghis Khan. I mean, that has nothing to do with who they're fighting for. And his point was that General Grant got the job done, even though he was a drunkard. Now, I don't know why he was even telling this story, but what he what he said was directionally correct. Well, the media made it sound like he went up there and he was just praising General Lee because he was a Confederate. And really, he wasn't. He was um, he was praising Grant for beating a quote great general. And NBC finally had to issue a correction because they were trying to make it out to say that he was just up there praising Lee as a great general and incredible. When in fact he called Grant incredible. But the whole thing is a tempest in a teapot because it's a throwaway story, if you ask me. I don't think it matters one way i don't even know why he told the story i think the reason he told the story i think grant is from ohio and he was in ohio and he was trying to build up ohio and then the media tried to make it out to be that he was trying to build up uh, uh the, the south to get to his ethno nationalism whatever they were trying to say he did and there he is they issued another apology that an earlier tweet misidentified the general president trump described in it as incredible at a rally in Ohio. It was General Ulysses S. Grant, not General Robert E. Lee, that he described as incredible. But really, it doesn't matter who he described as incredible. And then an attached clip lacked the full context of Trump's remark. Here's the full clip. Now, these types of mistakes happen all the time. They do them on purpose. It was obvious if you watched it, what he said. And it's actually irrelevant, really. They made it an issue by saying that he was praising Lee, and then they created reasons why he was praising Lee, when in fact he was praising Grant. This kind of stuff does irk me. All right. <laughs> they also had a 60 Minutes interview with this woman, Leslie Stahl, and um, Variety was upset with it because they allowed Trump to, um, they didn't edit out much. They say she was outmatched because he was his general, um, very direct self, and she was trying to get him I forgot the issue, uh, something about border and what was going on at the border. And he just said, look, I'm president and you're not. I don't know if that's out matching, but it came across, I suppose. Now, Nancy Pelosi was out meeting with, I that looked like Krugman, and it is indeed Krugman. And she said something, and, and you really can't understand what she says, but she said, if there's some collateral damage for others that don't share our view, so be it. I don't know what she was referring to, but it wasn't a bright thing to say. And there's Kane, former vice president, saying we got to fight them in the streets. I mean, they're complaining that Donald Trump is is um, characterizing the Democrats as an angry mob, but they're giving them a lot of a lot of ammunition. I mean, if you want to be shown as a protester, that's one thing. But when you say fighting in the streets, create a crowd, create collateral damage, and Hillary Clinton saying we can't be civil, I mean, you've you've given them. <laughs> The, the ability to say it's a mob. Well, then, apparently, Nancy Pelosi was uh, in Miami, and they created a little crowd around her and got in her face, and I guess she didn't like that very much. And then Trump is on this jobs, but not mobs kick. Now they're saying the Democrats lead by nine points in the NBC poll for the midterms. Now, the reason I, I think this is a nonsense poll is a generic poll means nothing because you don't run generically. They're all local. They're all local elections. And if you survey 428 people, and 40% Democrat, 35% Republican, the rest independent, depends on where they're from, because you don't. In order to win Congress, you're not going to. They're not going to win by nine percent. They're going to win some races by 12, 15, 20 percent. And they're going to lose some races by 2%. And so it's a foolish, I, I think it's a worthless um, poll because you really need to go race by race 
and look at each poll and then make the determination. A generic poll is foolish, and, uh, and it's obvious why it's foolish. We saw that Hillary Clinton won the popular vote, but lost the electoral vote. Similarly, the Democrats might end up getting more total votes for Congress than the Republicans, but lose seats. And you could see how that's possible. They win their seats in California and New Jersey and New York by wide margins, and then they lose by okay margins elsewhere. All right, let's see what else. Now, there's going to be a Supreme Court case to hear what could determine whether Facebook, Twitter, and other social media companies can censor their users. So that's something very important to watch. U.S. economic data. Retail sales did not go up very much. They were expected to go up 0.6%. They went up 0.1% in September. So we could be in the midst of heading towards a, re a slowdown, or maybe that was just a one-off but they're saying the u.s is the most competitive economy in the world for the first time in a decade but we did see sears go bankrupt during the week and there's janet yellen calling the president trump's attack on the federal reserve damaging to the fed and its financial stability and gary cohen also former trump advisor said the same thing the fed shouldn't comment on independent agencies like the fed and there is leesman interviewing cohen Tesla coin. Now, Elon Musk announced Tesla Tesla Kila, some kind of uh, tequila that he's going to put out. I'm waiting for Tesla coin and electric Lambo myself. Now, over on the Mueller probe, it looks like this is winding down. I had mentioned this that some people had already left. The two things that Mueller is looking for is Russian collusion, and there doesn't seem to be anything on that. And then the I think the even bigger Hail Mary is that there's some type of obstruction of justice because he fired James Comey. It'd be hard to obstruct something into something he didn't do, and Trump, I mean, and especially since a, he's entitled to fire his uh, FBI director if he wishes, and he also had a memo from Rod Rosenstein who said that Comey needed to be fired because the... FBI would never be the same if they didn't get rid of him. And then he has the AG report saying that Comey made many mistakes. Now, he did say on Lester Holt that he fired him because of Russia. But even so, he can fire him for whatever reason. So that is going to come to a close soon. But there's also a lot of evidence that the FBI concealed evidence that refutes the premise of the Trump-Russian probe. And those FISA warrants were all signed mostly on the basis of the intelligence that they received, the opposition research intelligence from the Steele dossier. And surprise, surprise, Rosenstein, the deputy attorney general who appointed Mueller, signed off on that. So not looking good for that investigation. And then the Republicans are still trying to track down information. Trump at one point said he was going to declassify it all. And I think what's going on there is Trump knows exactly what happened. He's seen all the documents. So are the Republican senators. They just want to get more. And the, and the Congress, they just want to get more of that information. I think Trump is just holding that back in case there's ever a political issue. And then he can declassify it. And I think what he did was he said he's going to declassify it. That let everybody believe that he actually would do it. And then he said, oh, no, I can't do it because some of our allies might not like it. I think he's just playing with them. I think he's shown that he now knows. And he might not ever declassify them if he doesn't need to. I think he will declassify them if they try to put him in a situation uh, to falsely accuse him of something. Then he can just rely on declassifying the documents. At least that's what I think is going to happen. And Politico is actually saying, Mueller report prepare for disappointment and there's been a lot of this hope that somehow Mueller is going to pull out the smoking gun and to date he hasn't pulled out any smoking guns they keep saying that he's made all these indictments but they've had nothing to do with the Trump and Russian collusion or obstruction of justice they've had to do with people related to Trump that have done their own financial misdeeds or tax evasion money laundering things like that, but that's got nothing to do with Donald Trump. Now, I guess the next thing against them, they want to go after his tax returns, but I believe he's been audited, and if there was any issue, they would have gone after him, I'd imagine.
But the other thing is here, the one big thing they thought was some type of political, not, not political, but some type of big win was that they had indicted these 12 Russian actors and these troll farms to show that Russia tried to interfere in the election. And that's no big deal because I would say every election, Russians and all other foreigners try to interfere in elections just as the United States tries to interfere in a, in a lot of foreign elections. I don't know if that was any big revelation, but they thought it was somehow important because it showed that they were onto something, but they never alleged that any of these Russians did anything in coordination with the Trump campaign. And now a judge is saying, uh, what what exactly did they do? Like, what, what did they do wrong? Uh, what law did they break? And um, so... It's getting tricky there, too. And I, I think also those Russians will never see the inside of an American courtroom. They're not there anymore. They're back in Russia. So that was for show, I think, those indictments. Now, the FBI acknowledges using multiple informants in investigation of the Trump campaign aid. So they had people uh, injected into the campaign to spy on them. And here, Judge orders Mueller to prove Russian company meddled in the election. Now, which makes it even more ridiculous, this Russian collusion story is Trump is pulling out of the 87 nuclear pact with Russia. I doubt Russia wanted Trump to get elected so he can, vi he can say that he violated the agreement and pull out of that pact. All right, dollar collapse. This is the point I've been making for so long is that the pet end of the petrodollar, the petrodollars are relevant today for so many reasons. It was relevant back when it was first instituted to get the Europeans to accept the dollar even though the United States had gone off the gold standard and refused to honor the Bretton Woods agreements by not allowing the French, the Germans, the Swiss, or whoever else who owned dollars who were signatories to the Bretton Woods agreements to bring their dollars to the U.S. Treasury and get gold for them. Nixon told them to go away in 1971. Well, in order to keep the dollar as the reserve currency and create demand for it, the U.S. with Kissinger and Nixon created the deal with Saudi Arabia. They would price their oil in dollars and only accept dollars for payment. And that created an artificial need or actual need for the Europeans to continue to hold dollars and as reserves so they can buy oil with it. But since the 70s, there's been far more reasons to hold dollars other than just to buy oil from Saudi Arabia. That was a temporary fix. And so, for example, today, there's far more countries that sell oil than just Saudi Arabia. Back then, one of the major oil producers was Russia, but you couldn't buy oil from Russia because it was part of the Soviet Union. The big game in town was Saudi Arabia. Well, today, the United States is a larger oil producer than Saudi Arabia. It's becoming a very, very large oil exporter, natural gas and coal exporter, as we discussed in a more recent, a more recent um, or a recent small gold live stream. So you need dollars also to buy oil from the United States. Countries no longer hold dollars just so they can buy oil. But if they did, they needed to buy oil from the United States. So the idea that the petrodollar is going to go away or that Saudi Arabia might decide to sell oil to China and Yuan, that's not a big deal. The big threat to the dollar is not Saudi Arabia changing its pricing. It's these other SWIFT style systems and the sanctions are causing the countries to quote, ditch the dollar for transaction, but not necessarily ditch the dollar for holding reserves because that's a very safe asset for a lot of countries. Yeah, so the point is the United States produces more oil than Saudi Arabia and also exports massive amounts of natural gas. Countries need dollars to buy oil and gas from the U.S. The petrodollar, in effect, is now backed by U.S. oil, U.S. natural gas, and U.S. coal. As I say, it was essential in the 70s, but that rationale for the underpinning of the petrodollar is not there anymore. All right, enough on that. Let's move on to, this is Daniel Lacay, he's a professor, he says the yuan's on its way to 7 to 1. Remember the whole gold back yuan game changer, China to crush the dollar. You know, ever since then, the yuan has collapsed 
and the gold price somewhat has as well. But you know, that Sun Tzu act weak when your Ponzi scheme is crumbling. I think more and more people are finally realizing what I've been saying for over a couple of years is that the Chinese economy is not some sound money, it's not based on sound money capitalism. It's a it's a credit based Ponzi scheme, and that's becoming more and more obvious. Petro Yuan, gold back Yuan, game changer, it is game changer. Here, Bloomberg gets in on the act now. It's funny when all the gold, what? It's, it's interesting to see how I've seen these end of dollar hegemony articles now appearing in CNN, CNN Money, Bloomberg, ever since Trump got in office. But before that, all the gold bugs were saying that end of dollar hegemony, China to crush the dollar, all that stuff. Um, but the mainstream media, look, when Obama was in president, never took that line. Now the gold bugs are aligned with the mainstream media, or some of them are. They keep banging on about China crushing the dollar, time to ditch the dollar, dumping treasuries, all that, that, that dollar collapse story. Now, tariffs, China has not responded positively to any of our asks. It seems that Trump and Kudlow don't really care that China has not come to the table. Now, I don't know how this is all going to play out, but they don't seem to be worried about it. China's stock market is down 40%, um, and the yuan is down significantly as well since all this started. And now they're having violence, public anger ups in China as home prices slide. China is in a much more tenuous situation than the United States. This is a very interesting chart. The guy Carl Za looks like he made this. This shows how in 2001, the, the relative size of the GDPs of China and the United States and then how much credit they created. And you can see as this thing goes along, that um, China creates more and more credit and what ends up happening is they don't end up creating more relative GDP and it just moves on and on and on and then you see the blue line here the GDP the US growing China's is growing but you see the credit is growing too and the credits growing and the credits growing and then the credit passes the United States but the GDP doesn't and then the credit really passes the United States and then the credit keeps passing the United States and gets bigger and bigger, uh, a bigger spread until you can see it's double that of the United States. And the only way China can continue to grow is by doing what they've been doing. You know, maybe one day they'll pass the U.S., but by then they'll have so much bad debt on their book books that it'll be unsustainable. All right. And China defends mass re-education camps as Uyghur Muslims transform for the better. Yeah, so they don't understand that China's not some sound money paradise. Now, Chinese GDP is at the lowest growth rate since 2009, 6.5%. So that's not a very good sign there. But of course, markets never stay down for long. Governments, including China, is always willing to do what it does, what it needs to boost them. And the Chinese securities regulator says they will effectively support share buybacks by qualified listed firms. And they need more credit. Zero Hedge, China's national team rescues global stocks as Yuan tumbles. Gold back to Yuan. All right, let's see what else we got this week. Now on to cryptos. There's a company in Europe saying they're going to get up to 25,000 online stores accepting cryptocurrencies like a PayPal arrangement. We talked about these companies, these large Wall Street companies, making moves into creating trading platforms, storage facilities, derivative products, and um, other cryptocurrency type products, ETFs. Uh, it's a lot of efforts gone into that, and most people aren't paying attention to it. But all the big names are in it. So ICE, this cryptocurrencies platform, backed is backed by the New York Stock Exchange, Starbucks, and Microsoft. That's just one platform that's expected to go live in November. Now, Eris X is another one which is backed by TG Ameritrade. So these trading companies, TG Ameritrade, Fidelity, are looking to get into, they've missed out on all this trading revenue. 
where they trade stocks, but people are trading on all these crypto exchanges. They're not making any of that money. They want a piece of that money. ICOs in 2017, I think it was $35 billion. It was more than the IPO rev the IPO values. They need to get into this stuff. I mean, the ICOs, that's money they didn't get a penny of. They want to have Silicon Valley backing ICOs. They want to have Wall Street bringing ICOs public, registering them with the SEC. And then they want to trade them on these exchanges. Bitcoin experts pin hopes on early November. Here's why. And I guess this is talking about backed. But there's other things. Uh, it's not just backed. There's Fidelity launching crypto trading platform via Coindesk. This article came to us, but there was a press release. Fidelity saying they're launching a crypto trading platform. And then a guy from Coinbase is going over to backed. So there's a lot of, quote, talent moving around. And here's stockbroker giant. TD Ameritrade bets on new cryptocurrency exchange. So they know that they've got millions and millions of customers with billions and billions of dollars. And they're talking about wanting to allocate a small portion of their money into these assets. And of course, they can make it happen with their money and their influence on regulation with the SEC, the CFTC. There's Fidelity starts crypto unit to serve Wall Street customers. Now, the thing about Wall Street they weren't involved in the last two big runs in 2013 and 2017 i said at the top of the show this is big money if this potentially can be bigger than the last two runs especially if wall street's involved and there's plenty of money for these people on wall street to make coinbase expands its european presence beyond the uk as brexit looms let's see what else now the interesting thing about backed is the platform will not support margin trading trading the contracts are fully collateralized and you get delivered bitcoin physical if you can imagine it being physical physical delivery of bitcoin now retail crypto has died we've seen a decline in volumes and prices but i think institutional crypto will light up when backed fidelity tg ameritrade platforms go live see they want they're talking about bringing bitcoin to your 401k to credit cards and so on i believe this is part of the plan to integrate the cryptocurrencies into the existing payment structure structures trading platforms and so on and and by doing so co-opting most of the idea that it's decentralized and outside of the banking system okay what else have we got here Gemini launches the licensed Gemini dollar. Now, a lot of people are talking about Tether. If you don't know anything about Tether, or if you, don't, if you, or if you only know about Tether, you think that, that it's a scam, and it may be. What Tether's supposed to do is be a cryptocurrency that's backed by dollars, but there's been a lot of controversy around whether they have the dollars and uh, whether it's a scam or it's being used to manipulate but I view Tether as Mount Gox. If it goes away, that's fine. That doesn't mean that stable coins are going to go away. Now, this one licensed by Gemini, this one has the FDIC backing. This one has U.S. regulation. So you'd be more likely to believe that the Gemini stable coin backed by dollars is actually backed by dollars than Tether. So if Tether ever goes away... You're still going to have this one. And there's countless other ones now that are being brought to market. There's also stable coins that are um, backed by algorithms that are intended to make it say stable. I don't know how that works. Rather than just them being backed by a fiat currency like the dollar. So the idea that if Tether goes down, the whole ecosystem goes down, uh, actually just belies an understanding of what's actually happening. The, the, the systems are not based no longer based on tether any more than the trading is dependent upon mount gox what else do we got goldman sachs and galaxy's digital mike norgoats invest 15 million in crypto custody firm so now you got goldman sachs involved in custody they still have plans at some point to roll out some type of trading some type of futures all of the big banks are involved in this all of wall street is somehow either directly or peripherally involved thinking about getting involved this the reason they want this is this is an escape valve for valuations they need just like china just like any entity needs to grow 
they need growing valuations they need growing trading profits they need growing storage fees they need growing um, IPO feeds so they can move those into ICOs this is how they do it they can make this crypto business tremendous um, the same way they made uh, ICO, uh, IPOs of companies that were non-profitable over the last 10 years, 15 years into big business. Tesla, Zillow, Fangs, all those companies, some of them are profitable, but the valuations that they've managed to throw onto these companies is ridiculous. And that's how they make money is by pumping stocks. Well, I think they're just going to move and pump cryptos. And it's a lot easier to pump cryptos because who knows what these things are worth. You can pump them to whatever price. The problem with pumping a real estate bubble or a stock market bubble, in real estate you run up against incomes. You can't pump them that high. People can't pay $4 million for a $210,000 home. And valuations. At some point, not a, people are not going to buy Tesla when it doesn't make any money. And they say, well, it's worth $60 million, billion now. And it's kind of hard to get that to be worth 300 billion, 800 billion if it doesn't make any money. But cryptos, why not? $40,000 for Bitcoin, $100,000, 3 million, why not? I mean, it just easily be $2, but if they want to pump it, it can just as easily be higher. I think that's where they're headed. Not investment advice. That's just how I look at this in a very uh, general way of how Wall Street likes to produce bubbles and they, they need to have at the end of every bubble a new one starts so you had the dot-com bubble then you went to the real estate bubble then you went to the social media fangs bubble i think it's time for a crypto bubble world's largest crypto exchange binance looks to add stable coins stable coins are very important so it's not just tether and they're going to make better ones more trusted ones just like more more better <laughs> uh trading platforms than mount gox Backed in Fidelity will bring enormous amount of capital into crypto, says Pantera Capital CEO. Now, a lot of these people are pumpers because they they have interest in these uh, things, but the point of things that are actually happening, backed in Fidelity, are happening. See, ICE is saying, which is backed, we're bringing the infrastructure that exists in the institutional markets to digital currencies because the institutional markets have not participated in the digital currency booms institutions are looking for the trust infrastructure and regulatory certainty that exists in ice markets here i say tether may end up being the mount gox of stable coins but it's not the end of stable coins and back saying our solution the buying and selling of bitcoin is fully collateralized or pre-funded and it will will not be traded on margin now here's something partnership could see up to 100,000 regular atms in the u.s now there's a few thousand and up to 2,000 atms in the united states what this company wants to do is add software to existing ATMs to allow them to just convert. So you don't have to add a new machine to convert the machines to spitting out Bitcoin. That could help with adoption. And the Winkleoff twins, their Gemini platform has added Litecoin. And now they're saying that the Litecoin fees will be lower by 10x. Now they're already low in the next release. And that's another reason for the payment systems to want to embrace these because it's a lot cheaper to transmit bitcoin and litecoin than it is to transmit via credit card and here's a guy hedge fund manager will accept bitcoin for a 16 million dollar uh, mansion a lot of people saying well bitcoin's never going to be the used by everyone doesn't have to be you don't even need mass adoption for it to be valuable and i say does everyone own a picasso or even a share of netflix you don't need everyone in the world. It's the same with Tesla. Not everybody has to buy Tesla or even like it. A lot of people hate it. But there's enough people that want to pay for it. That's why it's worth $60 billion. This guy is selling his mansion for Bitcoin. I'm a big believer in Bitcoin. He's a hedge fund manager. All right. I think that's about it here. SEC setting up a new office to talk to ICO startups. They also have a website, uh, sec.gov slash ICO. Anyone who's trying to tell you that they're trying to outlaw this stuff is not following what's going on. The SEC and the CFTC are actively encouraging this. Why? Wall Street wants it. Wall Street wants these regulated products so they can make their fortunes off of, SEC, off of registered SEC products, regulated products, and so on. 
And here's the press release. SEC launches new strategic hub for innovation and financial technology. You bring your S you bring your your information to them and they look it over and they tell you how to get compliant. You bring your lawyers, you bring your bankers, you bring your Silicon Valley investors. It all works out, I suppose. And there's the backed people talking about the first federally regulated physical delivery price discovery contract for the digital market. Now, Hungary we talked about. Hungary boosted its gold reserves tenfold by adding 28 tons. Poland added about 7.5 tons in September. Their goal is now at the highest in 35 years. Uh, people are saying China had control of the gold price. That lasted for about three months. I don't think they ever had any control over it. That was just what was happening. Gold was going down, and so was the yuan. And now the yuan is still going down, and gold is heading Higher. Now, there's this new gold-silver ally to supply U.S. military with lighter, more powerful devices. So there's a new use for gold and silver. This guy's pumping right here. Bitcoin pumper. Institutions will get into Bitcoin. Although I agree with this in Q1, Q2, uh, bringing new highs. I don't make price predictions, but I do think institutions will get in when you have these regulated products. But this guy's nuts. This guy says Bitcoin will replace gold and hit 700,000. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it could. I mean, there's no there's no limitation on the price of Bitcoin because there's no earnings. It's not like you would say, well, I, I can't uh, I can't pay more than fifty dollars for Bitcoin. Why? What do you base the price on? The the price could be zero. It could be one dollar. It could be ten million dollars. And again, these aren't price targets. I'm just saying, if there's no way of valuing it, it's just it comes down to how many people want it and how many of them there are. And that could drive the price higher. And if they're going to buy it up, store it, and put it into ETFs, that could make it scarce. And then people could think it's valuable and it can go higher. I'm not predicting that, but that's a possibility where it's very hard to say that you're going to take a company that doesn't make any money, that sounds cool, and you're going to drive it into a $150 billion company. They can do it. I mean, Wall Street's shown that. I mean, the central banks, they can buy it and they can drive the price up. And part of the reason for some of these very sky-high valuations on Wall Street, like Tesla, is because uh, banks like the Swiss National Bank own it. I mean, they're willing to invest money. You would think a prudent bank like the Swiss National Bank would only be buying dividend stocks, if at all buying stocks. But no, they buy the speculative stocks. So there is an element of... I don't know if it's called manipulation or support of markets by central banks and by Wall Street. They pump these companies out there as IPOs and they have to give them an afterlife and they continue to buy them or encourage their institutional investors to buy them. Well, here's Silver Pumper. Never heard this one before. Silver and gold to surge. A catalyst will create a massive upside surge in gold and silver. Always oh, just around the corner. All right. Well, thank you very much for listening. And we will see you tonight at 8 o'clock. And please join us each and every night at 8 o'clock Eastern Standard Time on YouTube. And also please subscribe to the smallgold.com site. You can see all the charts and information a lot better at the website. Also, like this video on BitChute and YouTube. And join us on Gab, Twitter, Google+, Facebook, and minds.com and steam it steam it as well and also consider donating to small gold via paypal becoming a small gold patron bitcoin litecoin or ethereum and if you're interested in buying precious metals you can do so through the small gold affiliate sites uh, links it's not investment advice to buy gold or silver but if you're going to buy and you've made your decision you consulted your financial advisor and you want to buy gold or silver you could do so at those links at golden eagle coin money metals exchange and sd bullion and you pay no more no less than if you visited those sites directly but if you do buy through those sites you do help the small gold out because small gold gets a small commission on every purchase thank you very much